Hey, welcome to Drum Talk with our own Stephanie Bennett. We're glad you're here. And today we have a very special surprise for you. Those of you who love Danny Serafin and our, our uh, Chicago lovers, we're going to talk about Chicago today. We're going to talk about your influences. So, Earl, why don't you start us out and tell us, um, first of all, why Danny Serafin? How did he come to be one of your influences? Well, it goes back to high school. Yeah. Um, in high school, I, I mean, I started playing drums in sixth grade, but it really wasn't until 10th grade where I got a drum set. And I remember I had a good friend, Bob Barry, who was a, basically a Chicago fan. And I heard some of the music through him, mm -hmm. and I saw a TV show with them on it back in the uh, 70s. Yeah. They did and anyhow, I bought Chicago 9, which was their greatest hits, and every song on that album... I love playing, except for maybe Color My World, to be honest. But well, that was so overplayed. I mean, that was the song we were all going after like five right. years. It was like you didn't want to hear Plus, that Plus, it anymore. really wasn't a drummer song, but it actually is a drummer song. It's got a very nice pocket and groove, and he did some very tasteful it things on really that, It really is a beautiful song. It's yeah. a beautiful song, beautifully played, very very much a keyboard song. And I didn't even realize it was part of the whole ballet for Girl and Buchanan. Again. So it was, a, it was part of that whole big thing on Chicago, too. So I just didn't understand it. But it started my quest in learning about Chicago. Just one second. Did you say Chicago 2? We're talking about the double album, right? Chicago 2, which was one of the... I don't know when, what order I bought my albums in, but I will tell you I bought Greatest Hits first, and then I started buying backwards, you know? This was my first Chicago album. Remember when we got to know each other, and we were talking about Chicago and how much we both love Chicago? Yes. This was my first one. And I played it so much, I swear. I made it skip. Remember when records would skip? Well, those all those records skip, by the way. There's nothing about them that doesn't skip. I mean, well, I learned playing drums with a record player and moving the needle and listening to the parts oh, yeah. and trying to learn all the licks <laughs> off of it. It's yeah. not like today where you go on YouTube and you watch your favorite drummer play something you can kind of learn it. You had to kind of figure out what the lick was. Right. Well, you know, when you... Um, I didn't know you when I got this album, obviously in 1969, you were like nine years old. Um, <laughs> right. I guess you're right about that, okay. <laughs> but I was, um, I, I had a friend um, in 1969 who, his name was Bob, and he was also from Oceanport, and he knew I loved Make Me Smile and Beginnings, because they were on the radio at that point. Right. And so he got me this album for Christmas, and... And Make Me Smile was on there, but not the way you knew it. Right, right, and, and and it wasn't until I got to know you that I even knew that it was part of a suite because I wasn't even looking. All I was doing was playing the hits, you know, and I didn't know anything about Danny. I didn't know anything about drummers, and right. then I got to know you. And I can understand, looking back, how he was your influence because the feel is so similar, and the, th the stuff I love about your drumming is so similar like that, that kind of elegant simplicity that's loose but really in the groove. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how, like, did you get that from him? Were you conscious about, like, trying to pick that up? Or do you think in trying his licks that you just did pick it up? T tell us about that a little bit. Well, I think when you're young, you kind of learn from the people that you're listening to. And I listen to every Chicago album from Sh Chicago Transit Authority all the way up to, to probably 17 or 18. You know, that's when I kind of started waning with Chicago. But, um... I will say that the first 11 albums with Terry Kath, the guitar player on it, when it was just the seven or eight of them, depending on how you look at it, um, when they added the percussionist, I mean, it was definitely a different band. And they had a rock sound, but they also had a jazz sound. And I, I got turned on to playing drums, playing in the little stage band in high school. And my friends, Bob Berry was a trumpet player, and... Uh, a good friend of mine, Bill McCabe, was the other drummer in school, and we both loved Chicago, and we played to, along to a lot of these albums. And I remember his favorite song was Call On Me, because he had his little concert tops. He played all the concert tops. I loved on that, that song. I, and love I always love playing Beginnings, and oh, yeah. well, I love playing all of them. I, I learned all, all the Chicago tunes. But Danny's style was such that it was loose, and it had technique. He seemed to have technique. You know, he had the Buddy Rich kind of technique. And he always soloed, didn't he? Like he always soloed. He had every song, every album. There was always something where there was a solo on it. Like um, in beginnings on this album, Chicago Transit Authority. Very first one. Very yeah, first album. Yeah. In the middle of the tune, there's a little brick bass breakdown that today, if you were to hear them play it on YouTube, if you found Chicago without Danny on it, you'd hear the bass breakdown. But back in the early days, it was it was Danny playing his little fill in there with the bass breakdown. 
and I always loved that that fill. Yeah. Matter if fact, I ever have, I want to talk more about your influence about Danny specifically, but. But I think that has to do with what the heck ha ever happened to Chicago. I mean, I know Terry Cap died and the whole band changed, but then it seemed to become like this hit machine where the hooks were great and they became very popular, but they really lost something. Was it just losing Danny Seraphin? And that, I mean, what do you think it was that changed them? Well, I. I I think they've never been the same since they lost Danny Seraphin. Not saying that Tris Imbo and the uh, current drummer of Chicago isn't a great player. I loved him with Loggins and Messina, yeah. you know Kenny Loggins and sure. and Al Jarreau, and I saw him on other things. He was a great. He's a great drummer. I think he's an awesome drummer, and I, I love his playing. But he's more in the Jeff Beccaro style. He's more of that studio perfect guy. And Danny always was the Buddy Rich, Bobby Columbia, Brook Blood, Sweat and Tears kind of player. Oh, good you stuff. You know, I mean, it was very yeah. loose and very jazz rock, and that's yeah. what he did. And I think you kind of lose it when you put the band on click to do arrangements and stuff. It just changes everything, and that's what Chicago's become. They've become a hit yeah. machine. And I think Danny's new band, CTA, California Transit Authority, is just an awesome band, and he's so much looser, and it's a lot more fun to... To watch his stuff and watching Danny play, and I'm so glad to see him come back. Yeah, I know his comeback in 2006 was a big thing for yeah. me because. Well, you saw him, you met him, didn't you? And you said he was such a great guy. He was like a nicest guy in the world. Oh yeah, I, I met him in uh, 2011 at Sam Ash Music in Miami, and I won this cymbal, this Zildjian Lucky medium guy. thin crash. Because I could name the the drum solo he was playing, <laughs> you which knew was, make, was the end to make me smile. Of course, I knew exactly what it was. I think I yelled it out before anybody else could even think about what it was. But um, <laughs> I got him to sign this symbol. Um, so this is a, one of my treasured things. I actually got a few things that day. I got him to sign Chicago Six, another great album. What were some of the cuts on Six? Um, Do you remember? Just you and me, feeling strong every day. Yeah. You know, those were some great hits off of this mm -hmm. one. Um, even some of the other things on here, What's This World Coming To, I mean, there's some great songs on this album. Just and then know. and then I got him to sign his book, Street Player, which I, I really... His enjoy. biography. His biography, yeah. It's nice to hear who he was and who he is and what made him who he is, you know? Exactly. But I think Danny's influence on drumming can be felt and heard in a lot of drummers my age, where we just grew up listening to that his playing and just mm -hmm. were inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And I think when I play anywhere, I always try to bring a little bit of that something he had, which was, he did a lot of things with like stick tricks, he calls them, but it's mostly like uh, paradiddle diddles. Yeah. And um, he would do a lot of like double sticking, single sticking yeah. type things. And I, I think I throw that into my playing. You do. He was big on roughs and rolls, he would do. You know, like roughs and five-stroke type rolls and open, loose rolls in his in his yeah. grooves and stuff. And I think that you hear in my playing. I do hear that in your playing. And what I loved about Chicago and realizing, you know, all those years ago when I met you, when we started talking about this, that much of it had to do with with Danny's playing, is right. that, you know, I was growing up, we were growing up in the rock era. Right. And you're a rock drummer. You play all other kinds of drumming, too, but you're basically a rock drummer. And I love rock music, and I and I I always did. But there was something about Chicago. The minute we heard Chicago, the minute Chicago started like "Make Me Smile" and, and "Beginnings" came on the radio, I listened. Something was special about them because it was more interesting than your mm -hmm. typical rock. Yeah. Uh, all the roughs and rolls that you're talking about, the a uh, little bit of the sloshiness, the little bit of little bit of playing with the time, the having fun with the other musicians and going with it and pulling back. It just seemed like much more interesting, the jazz elements, the jazz elements of it, so much more interesting. And Well, Danny was big influenced by Elvin Jones, oh. Philly Joe Jones. I mean, he listened to a lot of jazz drummers. Did I he? Mean, yeah. Um, Papa Joe Jones, he took brush lessons with during Chicago 5 when they did uh, Saturday in the Park and Dialogue, that album. Mm -hmm. He was taking brush lessons in New York City with Papa Joe Jones. I mean, he's in Chicago 7, he had a whole drum solo, Airy Suite, which was, um, you know, it was all about Elvin Jones. Mm -hmm. So he was definitely influenced by the master jazz drummers, yeah. but he was a rock drummer. Yeah. So it gave him a different thing, and it was a different feel. And, you know, I think for my playing, it was a great thing in a lot of respects. Yeah. But later on, you know, when I went to Nashville, I found out my time wasn't as together because I had this tendency to kind of try to throw everything in. 
So when you start playing studio, you start learning, you have to pare it back. And I think that's when Danny, you know, his, his playing became less interesting when he started playing on all the, the hit machine in the 80s. And yeah. I think that was their way of surviving. I understand that. And I don't have a lot, of, I don't have any bad feelings about it. No. I think if I had any bad feelings about Chicago is when they kicked him out of the band. Yeah, in 1982, I was just getting to know you, and, um, you know, I was a singer. I didn't know really anything about drums. But you didn't know my playing. We played together. We did play together. We played together for a couple of years, but um, I had been, it was the first time I really looked at the drummer up close and, and in a concert, and there was something very sim similar between you and Danny, and I remember turning to you and saying to you, what, you, I'm like, are you brothers? Like, you, 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 there's, you sound alike, you know. There, yeah, you and said it, something to me like, something like, uh, I see where you, you got your playing from. You sound a lot like Danny Seraphin. And I'm like, oh, well, that was a great compliment to me. That was a huge compliment. I didn't know I was complimenting right. you, but I knew that it sounded like it because, you know, at that point we were, you know, I was really zeroing in on drummers and um, right. uh, getting And of course, I was nowhere near Danny Seraphin's playing, but I mean. No, but the but, same kind of feel. Right, it was the a same feel kind of uh, fun joyful interesting not just not just like let's right. get to hit two and four um there was a looseness to a looseness but right. a, a great groove so you combine the great groove with looseness and right. it's just something beautiful something right. beautiful then we saw i think a lot of years went by and we saw chicago in 2005. right and 2005 it was tristan Bowden playing right and they were playing with earth wind and fire and earth wind and fire was they blew them away. Yeah, it, the sound was just totally different. You know, I mean, and I love Tristan Bowden's playing, yeah. but again, Chicago became something different without Danny. And it was, I, I will say that that was a tough period of my, you know, watching Chicago from yeah. the 90s. I'll never forget the documentary where they kind of axed him out of the documentary in 1992 or three on ABC. That was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, and it was it was silly. And I think a lot of Danny Seraphine fans at that point were really upset. And we were so, I was so happy to see him come back. And I bought the Modern Drummer DVD where he came back with CTA mm -hmm. and um, played. He was awesome. That was just awesome to see him. I, I still pull that out occasionally because he just, to see him come back to life yeah. and then yeah. to meet him in 2011 yeah. mm -hmm. was a big deal. That was a huge deal for me meeting him in 2011. When you have it, you have it. And he and certainly I mean, has that, it. having that picture of me and him just, getting up close and being able to, you know, get a picture with him. It was a high point. It was a high point. I, a, I, was, I was riding on a, cl on a cloud for a I couple days. There. That was an awesome time. We've met so many drummers and had yeah. so much fun interviewing and talking to drummers and, 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 and stuff, but that was, I think, that was probably your high point. Yeah, I definitely think so. He was my first drum hero, without a doubt. I mean, there's, I have had so many drum heroes since then. I mean, I would name all the studio guys I've met and know. And, try to play like a lot in a lot of respects, but Danny Serpin was my first drum hero. But it didn't carry over to equipment because he was a slinger lift player, wasn't he? Well, I, it almost did. Did it? Yeah. In uh, 1979, I went to Frankie Polito's shop in New, uh, York. New York City, and I went in there to buy a Slingerland kit, just like Danny Serpin's. I wanted a 20-inch bass drum. Um, I wanted two floor toms, 14 and a 16. Mm -hmm. I wanted a 12 inch tom, and I think I wanted a 13 tom, not because he had it, but he used to use 13 or 12 mm -hmm. with two floor toms. But I wanted a 20 inch bass drum because his little black slingerling kit had a 20 inch bass drum, a 12, and I think it was a 10 concert tom, and then a 14 and a 16. Anyhow, I went to Ippolito's shop, and they said, no, you sling, don't buy slingerling. They're not, they're not happening right now. In 79, it was not happening. And they were right, Slayerland was on the decline, and I bought the Gretsch kit behind us. And, and you've never regretted it. I've never regretted it. It's a great kit. By the way, I did find out that Danny Serfin actually played a Gretsch kit at oh. a concert from 1970. Um, I think it was the in the Massachusetts area. There's a theater, a famous venue they play there. And um, I found out it was a Gretsch kit. Somebody mm. posted a picture in the Danny Serfin Facebook group, mm. and I, I realized it had the big, you know, um, two mufflers, drum mufflers, that are mm -hmm. indicative of Gretsch. And I said, wow, that was a Gretsch kit. But the whole time, his hardware was falling apart on him. Oh, God. He started with three cymbals, ended up with two cymbals, because the stand on the, on the bass drum kept tilting in. Oh, and that gosh. was the thing the guy said in New York said to me. He said, do not Don't buy do any of the hardware. So all my hardware on my drums are, is pearl. I have all pearl hardware, because he refused. The guy said, you cannot get Gretsch hardware. It is garbage. And he knew. He was he right. He did not now, steer you Now, it's wrong. different today. Gretsch is, 
Gretsch has got a whole different thing hardware-wise today, but back in 1979, was not the, the hardware to buy. Gretsch was the worst. So I had my drums without Gretsch hardware on it. That's right. Uh, do you have anything more you want to say about your influences, or should we be ready to say? No, goodbye? I think we said a lot. I, I, you know, a lot of this is going to end up on the floor, but <laughs> you know. So. This is Earl and Steph. We're in Sanctuary Sound Studio, and we are really happy that you've joined us today for Drum Talk.